As melt down, I realize you like long titles, so I had the melting in water is a long title. Um, uh, but I uh, spoke with uh, David, and he said layering. He wants layering. So, uh, I, I, uh, and once you have melting and layering, in fact, you have melting in salty water. So, uh, so that's that's the title. Um, it's uh, joint work with uh, Ray Young, who did most of the simulation, and Chris Holland, who in fact was a PhD student here with Corm Killer Caulfield. Uh, Hauran Leo and uh, Roberto Versico, um, who is in fact the intellectual leader uh, on all code issues. So melding is a huge problem, um, and uh, it's one of the grand challenges in environmental fluid dynamics. Questions are, what is the melt rate of icebergs and glaciers? How does it depend on the parameters like salinity, and well, there you come to layering, temperature and size? And the current models are off by an order of magnitude or often even more by that. And then other questions is, how do these iceberg structures emerge here? You see here all these beautiful structures, so how do they emerge? <coughs> and once you understand this, how to upscale this to even larger problems. And the lack of understanding is on the fundamental level of this. Um, and the reason is that ice melting is a complex, multi-scale, multi-physics phenomenon. It's multi-phase and multi-component with salt and water, uh, uh, and it has a phase transition. I mean, yesterday in the talk at the dam, I said, well, interesting problems are multi-phase, multi-component with phase, phase transition, and this is yet another problem. Um, and it's multi-way coupled with memory effects. And from, from a mathematical point of view, it's a Stefan problem. So what is the evolution of the boundary between two phases during the phase transition? And here you see a beautiful Example uh, of Weedy et al., the group from Life Ristroff uh, from NYU. So, what they do is that they melt a cylinder of ice in water. So, here the surrounding water is 8 degrees, and then the melt water is heavier than the surrounding water. It goes down, protects uh, the cylinder here, and therefore it melts from the top to the bottom. Here, in fact, the melt water is lighter than the surrounding water because of the density anomaly of water at four degrees. So the melt water goes up, protects it here, and um, you get this shape. And in between, in fact, you get upward flow and downward flow, and then you develop a beautiful Kelvin Hamilton stability, and you get these beautiful shapes. And this is even in fresh water. And you will see later that things become much more complicated when you do it in salty water. So, um, it's multi-scale, so here you see the scales, uh, and smaller scales here, and larger scales uh, here. So you see two types of scales, I mean these structures here and these structures here. And while well, you, you see these structures here, I can tell you that there's no scientific evidence that these structures are caused from penguins sliding down these, uh, <laughs> these icebergs. So, um, so uh, here you see melting in a geophysical context, uh, and in particular the subglacial plumes uh, which majorly contribute to the basilar glacier melting. In fact, this uh, not proper treatment of these plumes is the main reason why these models are off so much. Uh, so uh, they play a role, they rise here, they interact with this ice and contribute uh, to this melting. Uh, so this objective of this research line is a quantitative understanding of melting and dissolution processes in multi-component, multi-phase systems across all scales and on a fundamental level. And what we want to do is we want to perform controlled experiment and numerical simulations in idealized setups on various length scales, uh, idealized to a degree that we can have a one-to-one -one comparison between experiment and numerics and theory. So. We will cast this melting problem into the canonical geometries of physics of fluids, uh, so into Rayleigh Bernard convection, into vertical convection, horizontal convection, Taylor Coet flow, and double diffusive convection, and then see uh, what's going on and whether we can describe it. So, the drosophila of physics of fluid is Rayleigh Bernard, a container of water heated from below and cooled from uh, above where heat is transferred. It's a closed system and you have global balances and uh, <laughs> things are mathematically well defined. Uh, so here you see the definitions of the problem. Uh, the Rayleigh number is dimensionless temperature difference. 
uh, the, which drives the system, Prandtl number, uh, is this uh, ratio between kinematic viscosity and thermal diversity, and then the aspect ratio here, uh, width uh, over height. Um, and the global response of the system is the Nusselt number um, and the Reynolds number, so the dimensionless heat transfer and the dimensionless turbulence intensity. And the question is how do Nusselt and Reynolds depend on Rayleigh, Prandtl, uh, and Gamma? So here you see um, the Rayleigh Bernard flow, where out of these fl slow, uh, small structures, uh, this large scale convection role develops just to visualize uh, what is going on. Um, so now let's cast the melting problem into Rayleigh Bernard. Um, and uh, this has been done, in fact, by Steve Davis and co workers back in 1984. So here you see ice and liquid and your heat. Uh, and by heating it, you melt uh, the ice and you get these structures here. Um, so here is experimental realization. But they were, in fact, limited to very, very small Rayleigh number. So 10 to the 6, which is really very small. Um, so this melting, by the way, causes uh, these uh, structures here at the bottom and uh, causes then the structures uh, into the ice. So what happens is that uh, the ice melts from the bottom and at some point, in fact, uh, the uh, iceberg turns over and the origin of the structures here, in fact, is the underwater melting uh, of, of the ice. So it's really uh, developed underwater, so not above water. So how to achieve these very large Rayleigh numbers um, and our Taylor numbers or Reynolds numbers, which are necessary to understand this? Um, well, we have um, a finite difference code, second order finite difference. There's no turbulence modeling in it, so no LES or something. And this massive parallelization is 10 to the 4 cores. It's really petaflop, uh, com petaflop computing. So one snapshot for the largest simulations we have, one snapshot of temperature field and velocity field for these cases, uh, in fact, is up to 15 uh, terabytes. I mean, it's just huge, and how to handle it is, is really getting a problem. We have this extremely efficient Poisson solver, and the trick is that we can go to large Prandtl or large Schmidt number, as uh, we heard uh, necessary in uh, oceanography, so Schmidt number <laughs> is 700. Uh, and we do so by having a multiple grid solver. So um, the um, temperature field and the salinity field live on a much finer grid as compared to the velocity field, uh, and therefore we, we can do things efficiently by this uh, multiple grid version. Uh, we have uh, GPU versions, and we coupled it to immerse boundary methods to treat the boundaries, so it's advanced finite difference. We have open sourced this, uh, and uh, we have done so over many generations of PhD students, so Richard Stevens, Rodolfo, and many others, uh, under the intellectual leadership uh, of Roberto. So the flows we have uh, applied uh, this code to is Rayleigh Benard, which you saw. It's double diffusive convection, and here it's fingering convection, which you have seen this morning in the talk. Um, and, well, Taylor Gerd flow, um, two layer systems. Uh, so two non-miscible liquids, um, where we also have heat exchange between them. We have dispersed systems, dispersed multiphase flow, with bubbles and drops in the flow. And then during um, the corona crisis, we applied it to aerosols, and we also applied it to ventilation. So in fact, just to give you an idea of what we can do, we can really do direct numerical simulations of a 3 times 3 times 3 room with the person sitting in it and really do DNS. I mean, this takes about a month. Of course, for practical applications, um, well, you won't have faster results, but for benchmarking uh, some AES codes, it's of course very crucial. So, um, here you see the presently largest direct numerical simulation. This is the top view on the boundary layer, done by Richard Stevens. Rayleigh is 10 to the 13, and you see these beautiful structures developing. It's really uh, multi scale. And in fact, when you read, want to read more, about it, so in November, the physics today came out on turbulent thermal convection, which we wrote. So here you see the structures, and uh, I, I wrote this with Olga Shishkina uh, on ultimate, turbo, uh, ultimate uh, turbulent thermal convection. So this is supposed to be a generally accessible introduction to uh, ultimate uh, turbulence. Uh, 
In fact, this, uh, this turbulence produces beautiful pictures, and uh, our passion for turbulence is shared by the PR cover designer. Um, and uh, well, they put uh, relevant art pictures from us uh, often on the uh, on the cover, which is very very nice, of course. Um, so, what are the uh, models? Well, it's um, advanced finer difference extended to multiphase flow with the phase field method. So here we see another Stokes um, and uh, buoyancy coupled uh, and surface forces coupled. Um, here you see the advection. Diffusion equation for the temperature and the corresponding equation, in fact, for salinity, incompressibility. And then, as um, force field, we couple uh, the phase field model for some volume fraction with the Kahn Hilliard equation. So, this you see here, we put in some chemical potential. Uh, we have a Kahn number. I mean, I won't go into technical details here. Uh, we um, uh, put these technical details into this article in Journal of Computational <laughs> Physics. Uh, in fact, we were not the first to do it. The pioneer of doing this, in fact, is sitting over there, Benjamin Foyer. He did beautiful work on, on this um, in the last, uh, I would say, the last 10 years, um, and uh, really pioneering work with exactly this method applied uh, to melting problems. Um, so, well, here are other calculations from, from Benjamin and co workers. Here, and here also uh, melting with shear. Uh, is really uh, great and very, very relevant work. Um, so we extended this advanced final difference to also include the density anomaly. I mentioned that you uh, need that to explain certain phenomena. So um, the density has its maximum at four degrees here, and you put this in, and we put in a standard parameterization, um, which is always used, and couple it here. And what we also put in is we put in, uh, well, the, the phase field penalty term here, and we put in latent heat. Um, so latent heat must also be put in, and latent heat made dimensionless uh, gives you the Schaeffer number. So that's, uh, that also matters, um, because, uh, well, latent heat under certain conditions uh, can be very, very crucial. So uh, the summary of these numerical methods are shown here. We have our original highly efficient advanced finite difference code, uh, we have this multi-grid resolution uh, to be able to treat double diffusive convection. Uh, and we have a MERS boundary method coupled to this. Uh, and um, the last extension is to extend it to phase field method with phase transitions. Um, and well, the, the relevant references are given here. And uh, well, here is the intellectual leader on, uh, on this code. Uh, well, there are various code validations which we uh, give uh, in these papers. I want to show one, uh, in fact. So here uh, it's a really banal setup with ice at the top and water at the bottom and you heat. And the question is, given the temperature here, where, what's the height of this interface? And there were very precise experiments. Um, and uh, these are our numerical simulations, so we exactly reproduce uh, those experiments and also other numerical simulations. So now let's come to some problems. I will first show three problems very briefly, and then I come to the layering problem. So the first problem is by stability in radiatively heated melt ponds. So here you see melt ponds. So this is the top view. See all these little melt ponds and. And if you zoom in, you see here a melt pond. Well, this is, you see human scale here. And these melt ponds are, of course, a major problem because they change the albedo. Um, and you, you don't want them. But in summer, uh, in the Antarctic, uh, in the Antarctic summer, they, they are unavoidable. And they melt this. So the sun, intensity of the sun is typically 160 uh, watt per square meter, and uh, this leads to the melting. So the, the, the mechanism is as follows. So you, in fact, you melt the upper layer here, and now you have this density inversion. This means that the water directly above the ice, which has zero degrees, is lighter than the water, the water up there, which has, say, four degrees or zero degrees. So you get a convection roll um, up there, and this convection roll eats into the ice. So, this, so this, this water wants to go up because it's zero degree, it's light. And then you get this roll, and here this roll eats into the ice. So this is our numerical simulation of this. Here you have the ice, zero degree here, 
and some uh, radiation here, so it's heated, so it's uh, in fact heated, therefore it's getting heavy, goes down and eats into the ice. And the question, of course, is um, when do these melt ponds uh, form? So how to model this? Well, there's absorption, and you can uh, model the absorption with some lambert bear law. So typically they take four frequencies, and depending on the frequency, we have different absorption lengths. Uh, this leads to this local heating up there, um, and uh, then you take your equations, put in uh, this, uh, um, heat, uh, this uh, source term, this heat source term, at the very top, uh, or the, the top layers, so I mean it's bulk driving, so to say, um, and that, in fact, you can translate to a Rayleigh number, so I, I0 is the intensity of the light, and that translates to a Rayleigh number, uh, and well, then you have Prandtl number and you have your Stefan number uh, and your heat. And then the question is, what uh, is H in this equilibrium? And the key question is, under what conditions do melt ponds form? Um, so when you have little sun, uh, you may get a little melt pond or it may freeze. Or we have lots of sun, uh, then it eats into this. So we want to vary the initial depths of this melt pond and then see what's, uh, how is it evolving, and we vary the intensity. Um, and well, here you see, in fact, results. I will abbreviate this quite a bit. I will only show you two cases. Um, so parameter space is the initial depths here, uh, and this is the intensity of the sunlight um, given in watts per square meter or given in Rayleigh number. So the dimension is parameter as a Rayleigh number. And in fact, those values here are Arctic summer, and those values here are winter, and of course uh, it, uh, it also depends on how many clouds there are and so on. Um, but let's see what's happening in this situation. We we'll start off with a little melt pond of some depths. We have radiation. And what you see here in this case is that it freezes back to a situation where it's gone, and that's fine, uh, albedo is recovered, so that's okay. Now you go down here, so same uh, radiation, in fact, but um, uh, deeper initial depths, and this is what you get here, um, so here it doesn't recover. In fact, you have a tipping point, so once, in fact, the melting has been gone to a degree that a certain depth is reached, uh, so it's the same intensity, uh, you don't recover. Uh, so it's a tipping point and no reco full recovery of the ice. And why well, we did also all the other points, uh, of course, when you go uh, to a higher intensity, it melts deeper. And here's a full phase diagram, a phase diagram on uh, the depths here and the intensity of the slide. And well, I had um, shown you pictures here. So I have two stable states. There's this stable state uh, up here, um, which is a fully uh, frozen state, so all fine. And then you have the stable branch here. Uh, so when you have enough intensity, uh, you end up on this stable branch. This is this melt pond. Uh, but here you have an unstable branch, and when you then uh, stop he uh, start here, you go to the stable branch, when you are here, you go here. So it's really a classical uh, tipping point, a classical bifurcation. Uh, and this curve here, we can in fact calculate analytically. So, uh, and those are all numerical simulations, so uh, this, uh, this recovers. So this is very important, and, and those values here, in fact, are very realistic values. So it's really a very realistic problem here, and it's, it's nice that with this kind of approach, this can be really fully understood and be traced back to a bifurcation diagram. So the conclusion on this is we have bistability, we have subcritical bifurcation here, we have a tipping point, and in fact uh, with our theory we can predict also the functional uh, temperature, functional dependence of the bulk temperature and of the intensity of the flow in, in, in this. I mean, I, I don't show this details in this paper here. So, uh, where will the rest of the talk bring you? Well, a second example, I will show you Rayleigh Banal with fresh water at very large Rayleigh number. I will show you vertical convection with fresh water, and I will focus uh, on, on requests of, of David, I will focus on this layering, vertical convection with salty water. Yeah, so, this with two and three will also be quick. Uh, so, uh, two is 
the morphology evolution of a melting solid layer above a liquid heated from below. Um, so again, the question is how do these structures evolve here? Uh, so the control parameter in this case uh, are Rayleigh, Prandtl, and well aspect ratio and uh, Stefan number we fix. Um, and the response parameter is the roughness which develops. Um, and the wavelengths of this roughness and the Nusselt number. Um, and uh, this is a typical experiment. So this is Rayleigh 10 to the 8. Rayleigh based on the distance here, uh, we will start to, to heat and uh, melt the water. So let's uh, start to melt. And the uh, actual Rayleigh number is shown here. This is then based on the mean uh, height here. <laughs> Uh, and this is, of course, an increasing with, with height. And what you see is that these rolls develop and that these uh, structures here are coupled to these convection rolls here. And you see merging events. Um, but the structure in the ice which develops is a slave to the structure in, uh, in this uh, relevant flow. Um, so you, you get, uh, in fact, uh, these plumes hit the solid surface, they melt, and you get this ejecting, ejecting plumes and these cusp form. Um, and uh, this works up to Rayleigh number, say 10 to the 8 or so, 10 to the 9. But when you now go higher in Rayleigh number, and here we go 10 to the 11, it becomes so turbulent um, that uh, the structure in the ice becomes decoupled from the structure uh, in, uh, in the flow. So up to now, it still works. So now, but now we are, we are beyond 10 to the 9. And then uh, those cusps, which you had seen before, they become unstable. Uh, and um, uh, then, uh, in fact, the structure up here is uh, different um, as compared to the structure of these rows. So to say, the, the, this boundary layer here develops its own instabilities. And you, you get a decoupling of the structure, which, which we understand and which we explain in this paper. Um, so um, here you get this instability here. So uh, first you have the stable plumes, but then this cusp is getting unstable and you get structures, get structures of this type here. You get multi cells. Um, you, of course, wonder I showed this two dimensional simulation, and there have been this question before 2D versus 3D. So we did the same thing in 3D. In general, in fact, for Rayleigh Benar, uh, with Prandtl number larger than 1, 1 and larger, 2D and 3D give pretty much the same. Uh, so, I mean, it's very safe to do 2D numerical simulation. Of course, the numbers are slightly different, but 2D simulations uh, for Prandtl is, is 1 and larger, in fact, are very, very, very good to give you an indication of what's going on. If you go to uh, liquid mercury, um, liquid sodium, Prandtl is 0 0.02, it's a different story, but here it's fine. Yes? Uh, here, yeah, this is um, this is fresh water. Yeah, I mean, the non oh yeah, we use a full nonlinear equation of state. Yes, uh, but this is fresh water. I come to the salty water in a second. So, uh, so we now look into the evolution in 3D. So this is the side view. With time, you see the structures, and now we look from the bottom, and you see these structures. So the color is the depth of the structures. Note that the scale is changing here. So uh, the structures get larger with time uh, because these rolls get larger, uh, but they also get deeper with time. So um, this is really a very nice view on the developing uh, topography. And we understand the length scale also. So you see this typical length scale. I mean, we do a spectral analysis of these pictures, extract the length scale, and then understand how this length scale depends uh, on the Rayleigh number and Stefan number. I, I don't have time to go into this because I want to come to the layering. Um, so um, well, the question is, how do they compare with field measurements? Well, here I show you, uh, in fact, on the left, the field measurement. This, I think, literally I took out from here. And this is what we did on the numerics. It looks very similar, but I must uh, caution you uh, because this was in salty water, obviously, here, whereas this is in fresh water. So there are many ways to create structures, and one must be very careful. So we haven't done a one-to-one -one comparison of those structures uh, here with what we see in uh, salty water. I mean, I think in general, I think that these uh, scallops which develops are thanks to plumes locally, 
whereas these bands, which I showed in the beginning, these sliding uh, slides of these penguins, uh, they are by, thanks to layering, and I'll come this, to this in a second. Um, so the conclusions of this part is um, that these, um, uh, well, we, we understand the structural formation, the scallops resemble those of the measurements, but must be connected. And we understand, in fact, uh, the growth of these structures as a function of time. They are connected with these convection walls. Um, so it's, and more details are in, in, in this paper. In fact, the morphology evolution of the melting solid layer above its melt, uh, heated from below. And so the third subject is uh, vertical convection with fresh water. Again, a full equation of state. Um, and there we see an abrupt transition from slow to fast melting. The situation is here, so it's now vertical convection. It's heated from here, and on the right we have some ice which we want to melt away. And the objective is, uh, does the melt rate depend, uh, how does the melt rate depend on the parameters? So these are typical parameters here, uh, bundle of water and a rally number of this type. And we measure the melt rate and the heat transfer. We do uh, full equations, but for comparison, we also do uh, linear water without the density anatomy. But I will focus on real water here. Uh, and um, this is what we get for 20 degrees. So from 20 degrees, we have that the top part of this ice melts faster than the bottom part. The reason is that melt water is heavy, goes down, and protects this. So we have an evolution of the front in this direction. When we go to cold water, it's the other way around. Then, in fact, the melt water goes up here, uh, and um, we, we get a melting fronts of this type. So here, uh, and this evolution. But when we go in between 10 degrees, it's complicated. The top part melts faster than the bottom, but the middle part melts the slowest. Uh, and this is, in fact, because of this uh, complicated uh, inversion of this density around 4 degrees. And uh, well, it also works in 3D. Uh, so here we see the 3D visualization for those cases. Um, and um, uh, we, uh, and this affects this complicated flow, reflects in the melt rate. So when, without the water density, uh, the melt rate as function of temperature is simply a linear function, very boring. But because of the density anomaly, you get this jump. So uh, I, I mean, I uh, dare to call it tipping point in a general sense. I mean, it's not tipping point in the strict sense of a bifurcation theory, and hardcore bifurcation theory people may not like this, but this, in a sense, is not a real tipping point. It's simply enhanced melting. But the geophysicists, they got more generous or more, uh, yeah, more generous in using the word tipping point, and uh, well, they were okay at calling it tipping point. So, um, and the, the explanation is this flow, local, the reversed flow, which, we, which, you, which you find. Um, and you can, in fact, make a full balance uh, of this. So here you have your ice. What end does is the net heat flux from the side. And this is used to increase this bulk temperature here. And it is used for the phase transition. And well, heat goes out there. And then based on this balance, a really very simple balance, you can uh, calculate uh, in fact, uh, those curves here, this is this curve which you can calculate. And when you rescale things uh, in this way, whether it's 2D or 3D, without or with density anomaly, it's all on this curve. And then you must rescale it to get the physical quantity. So this is also uh, under control. Um, what is the boundary condition on your left boundary? And is the position at that boundary matter? Uh, well, I mean, it, ma it matters with the left bound, bound matters, of course, how long it takes. Uh, so it, it matters for the balances between those terms. So how much water you must uh, heat. So in this sense, it matters. Uh, but it's, uh, in fact, it, it, it's a constant temperature, temperature, constant temperature as con condition, and no flux. So constant temperature, no flux, and uh, no slip. Uh, so, um, well, now I come to, to layering, vertical convection with salty water ice melting in salty water, and it's a huge effect. I mean, you can try yourself. So throw ice in water and throw ice in salty water. It's a huge difference in this. You can really try very easily. Uh, and of course, in the geophysical context, it's always salty water. So it's of huge importance. And questions I would like to ask is, how fast does the ice melt? Uh, how does the shape evolve? 
do scallops uh, evolve? What is the dependence on control parameter and how to upscale this to glacier scale and beyond? And there has been a very famous paper which has been done here, in fact, by Herbert Huppert and Stuart Turner. Well, not here, but probably in, um, uh, in the old Dumped Institute downtown. Um, beautiful paper. And here you see the layering, right? I mean, you love layering. What's, what's done is that uh, this uh, ice block uh, is melted into a salinity gradient. And uh, the question is, what is the map rate? Uh, so if you now look into uh, this, it's double uh, diffusive uh, uh, convection. And it's good that we had two introductions this morning. Um, so the parameters I will use is, in fact, a Rayleigh salinity, Rayleigh temperature, and then two Prandtl numbers or Schmidt numbers. Those I keep fixed. Uh, but when you are then in this parameter space, you have then this two scala Rayleigh Bernard. This is what has not been addressed. So when the flow, in fact, is driven both by the temperature and by the salinity. So this gives really very heavy turbulence because both drive it. And then you have a fingering double conducive convection. This was, in fact, the subject, main subject of the first talk today here. And, uh, well, I call it, uh, in fact, uh, a fingering double diffusive convection. Or this is the convection which occurs in the tropical ocean. And this is what occurs in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, diffusive double diffusive convection where you get this layering here. So this is now driven by the temperature field, whereas the salinity field <coughs> stabilizes. Um, so those are uh, those four domains, and well, the most interesting ones are those. And for the layering, this is the interesting one. Um, and I happen to have the same picture, which you saw before. So uh, with this very nice paper from Stelma, experiment from Krishna Maturi, then um, Ray, Ray Schmidt from Woods Hall, I mean, the very famous paper from Science, he gets this layering both for the temperature and for the salinity. And we worked also on this. In fact, um, when I was in, in Woods Hall in 2018, over the summer, Korn was there, and then we applied our uh, code to layering and vertical transport in sheared double diffusive convection. So this is this paper. Uh, which uh, came out in uh, 2022, um, uh, four years after we had our summer school, but well, it reflects the care which we put into the paper. Uh, <laughs> and you see beautiful layering here. Um, so it is also in this upper left quadrant uh, where if you diffuse with double convection. But you can have also other cases of uh, double diffusive convection with layering, and you can do it in a lab. And in fact, you can do it also during your coffee break with coffee latte. Uh, so I will play this again. So this is a paper from Howard Stone's group. Uh, and you have, uh, in fact, uh, the, you start off, let's go back. You, you start off uh, with um, milk and you pour in coffee and then you get this layering here. And this, in fact, it's a beautiful example of double diffusive convection. Um, so, uh, you see here the layering here. Uh, in fact, uh, you have the layering concentration-wise in vertical direction. Uh, so here lots of milk and here uh, lots of coffee. And then you have cooling from the side. Yeah, in the core of your cup it's hot and you cool from the side. So you have a vertical convection with respect to temperature uh, and well, really Bernard type convection. Uh, with respect to um, the uh, concentration. And uh, let's see what develops. So we modeled this. So less concentrated here, more concentrated here, cooler here, and hotter there. Uh, so again, it's, uh, it's exactly in this. Um, this stabilizes, whereas temperature destabilizes. Uh, and um, the Parameters are the Schmidt number and the, the Rayleigh number with respect to temperature and Rayleigh number with respect to salinity. Uh, and you can translate this also to density ratio, so lambda. This had also been introduced before. <coughs> so the ratio of the stabilization by salinity and the driving by, by temperature. Uh, and you see uh, the density depends both on temperature and on salinity. And here, here we have a linear relation. I think that's okay. And this is what we get. So temperature on the left and concentration on the right. 
you get this beautiful layering event. So watch it do this. I mean, how they emerge. Yeah. So again, you get this instability, beautiful layering, and it was explained in both talks how this uh, layering comes about. So again, here emerging event. Um, when I first saw these layering events in the geophysical context, I mean, I kind of didn't like them because my background is theoretical physics, statistical physics, and I always strive towards something which is statistically stationary. But then what I learned in this Woods Hall uh, workshops from my friends in geophysics is um, there is nothing like statistically stationary in the ocean. I mean, everything is driven, everything is far from equilibrium. Don't focus on statistically stationary things. Um, these emerging events are also interesting. Here now we'll go to the same for larger density ratio, and you see many, many emerging events here for this concentration here. Uh, and they, of course, they uh, coincide with uh, peaks in the, uh, in the transport quantities. So both transport in, uh, in the of heat and transport of um, concentrations. So let's uh, play it a little bit longer. Some more events to come. No. Um, so the layering depends on the density ratio. We have three density ratios here, and um, here no layering for small density ratios, but for larger density ratios we get uh, this layering events. Uh, and in fact, uh, to get layering you must go into certain region of the parameter space. Uh, so here it's the driving um, Rayleigh number, driving temperature. And um, here is lambda, the density ratio. Up here, everything is stabilized, you get no convection. Here you have quasi-vertical convection, temperature doesn't play much of a role, but in between you have these layered regimes here. And this is the initial number of layers, but this is this most interesting regime where you get the layering. Well, this was, uh, so to say, double diffusive convection and layering uh, into your coffee latte, which you can try, uh, try over, over lunch. But let's uh, back to vertical convection with double diffusive uh, melting. Um, so here we have now horizontal, uh, horizontal temperature gradient. We have ice on this side. Um, uh, and we have a stabilizing vertical uh, salinity gradient. So lots of salt here, not so much salt here, stabilizing. And we heat from this side. So the control parameter, in fact, are this vertical, uh, this uh, delta S vertical. Um, and uh, the other control parameter is the horizontal saw gradient. So we average the bottom and the top, so towards the middle. And then we subtract to here. And here, of course, it's zero because it's fresh water. So these are our two control parameters. Um, and that we translate, uh, in fact, to the Rayleigh of the temperature, Rayleigh of the salinity. Well, Prandtl we take 10, as typical for water. And Prandtl salinity, or the Schmidt number, is uh, 1,000, also typical for the ocean. And we keep the Stefan number at realistic value. And um, what's crucial is to put in the density anomaly. And I showed up to now the density anomaly for fresh water. Uh, 4 degrees. Uh, you have the melting at, uh, at uh, zero degrees, you have the melting of water. At four degrees, you have the density maximum. But this only holds once you have no salinity. When you now add salinity, the freezing point goes down, as you all know, but also the line of the maximum density goes down. In fact, at 25 gram per kilogram, uh, this density anomaly is gone. And uh, the uh, typical salinity in the ocean is 35. So this density anomaly is interesting for lakes, but not for the ocean. So, uh, and the full equation is known, so how temperature depends on salinity, uh, how density depends on salinity and on, on temperature. So let's see the effect of the vertical stratification on the ice melting. Uh, so here is fresh water, uh, and here we now have 5 gram per kilogram, uh, and here 10 gram uh, per kilogram, and you see you get this ripple formation in the ice only for medium vertical stratification. So here, in fresh water, you don't get it. Here, you also don't get it. But for medium vertical stratification, you get it. This ripple is developed. Uh, this also holds in 3D. So here, you see the temperature field, salinity field. And here, 
the developing ripples. These are the ripples which I showed you before. Um, so they emerge at the ice block at the site thanks to this layering. Um, and uh, note that the structure which forms these ripples, of course, a different structure than the scallops, which I showed you before. Uh, so we study the effect uh, of the uh, average salt concentration on the ice melting, and uh, you see that the ripples are robust phenomena. So um, uh, what, what, what you take here I mean, is very robust. The, um, what's crucial, in fact, is uh, the vertical uh, stratification. So here is the overview. So in all these cases here, um, for medium um, uh, uh, Rayleigh salinity, here, we, we get these structures, whereas here and here we don't get this, and we understand this. I mean, I'll show you in a second. Um, but the key question now is, to what degree uh, do these structures, which uh, are developing, um, agree with what uh, Hubbard and Turner measured? So they measured this, and this is what we found. So I was flabbergasted by this. So the gray data point are those from 1980, done, experiments done, 1979. And uh, the color data points are our uh, numerical simulations. I mean, no parameters. We simply took, so to say, exactly the parameters they did. And what uh, Hubbard and Turner could do in the lab more than 40 years ago, we can now do on the computer and recover this line. And also, um, uh, Herbert and, and Turner, they did this nice theory. So Herbert was very pleased. I sent this to him, so he was very pleased. This. Uh, let's briefly men uh, mention the effect of this average salt concentration on the melt rate. It's non-monotonic. So you see, uh, this is fresh water, uh, and here, uh, this is, in fact, uh, the, the melt rate, uh, how uh, the structure goes down. It's non-monotonic. So here, it first goes up, and then it goes down again. You see this again. Um, so the, the melt rate, it first goes down, and it then goes up. And... Uh, well, what's this mechanism? And we look into this in great detail and look into these profiles, uh, density profile and salinity profile and temperature profile. And what turns out is that there's a competition between uh, the thermally and salinity induced buoyancy. And uh, at this medium uh, uh, gradients, they just compensate. So here you see this. Um, this is, in fact, the density, the vertical velocity here. And you see that. Um, for this medium um, uh, uh, gradients, this is smallest. Uh, here, velocity is going up, taking away lots of heat. Here, velocity is going down, taking a lot of heat. But there is a regime where they just balance, and therefore the melting rate there is slowest. And we can go, in fact, in the full parameter space here. Um, and um, we work out uh, those balances work by thermal buoyancy versus work by salinity on the one hand, and potential energy by salinity versus work by salinity, and we come out that the optimum rate is when these two uh, lambda ratios are one, and uh, those data are our optimum values here, and it's really around this one and around this one. Well, uh, the overall conclusion on this part is uh, that we can numerically treat uh, this um, uh, melting of ice in uh, salty water, uh, we get these structures and we see the competition between thermally driven buoyancy and salinity driven buoyancy uh, and uh, salinity stable stratification. Um, and while well, that I will drop, uh, skip, and the overall summary is here those uh, two four subjects and with the four corresponding movies which you have all seen. Here with this beautiful layering. Um, and the more general lessons on melting is, well, it's hugely relevant. It offers great problems to fluid dynamics. And while well, we have a closing gap um, between what can be measured and what can be simulated. So, I mean, I'm happy that we can now do the experiment Hubbard did uh, 40, 44 years ago. Um, and I think also we have closing gaps between field measurements and, uh, and experiments in the lab and numerics. And well, extremely rich phonology, multi-dimensional parameter space, and I think it's an excellent example to learn and to decipher complex and counterintuitive pro problems. It's work in progress. In fact, I have this uh, project, and we have PhD positions available. If you have smart 
the PhD students can let us know and let them know. And my time has melted away. Uh, Michael is already getting nervous. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for just a couple of questions. I'm sure there'll be lots, but let's hear one or two. Yes, mind you. So in uh, the parameter, you didn't discuss that much with the theta number, which might be very big or very small, yes. and I really find. So how do you think some of your results could be changed when you start to have time scale separation between the flow and the phase change? So it's, a, it's a crucial parameter. We took here, we took basically the Schaeffer parameter, Schaeffer number as compared uh, for, for, uh, for the case of water, for most cases. Uh, often it is uh, such that uh, taking realistic Stefan numbers slows down the process. And what we did uh, in, uh, in this uh, one last case, where I didn't have time to show this, is that we uh, modified the Stefan number such that the equilibrium is reached earlier. Um, but I mean, for the basically, it tells of the time scale of the dynamics. Um, uh, and uh, there, there it matters, but I mean, for this final equilibrium, which is uh, achieved, it's not so important. And well, in oceanography, you take the Stefan number of water. And, uh, so. One more question, there is one. Otherwise, it can be later. Yeah, David. Um, I just wondered if you could comment on any differences that you think there are between layering in what you call uh, vertical convection, lateral heating, and traditional problem. I mean, you, you get layering in both, right, in the diffusive yes. regime. Is there going to be difference in their stability properties and everything in terms of an actual layering mechanism? I think it's, it's I think the, the basic mechanism is similar. So, uh, but I mean, uh, one, one would have to specifically uh, analyze a certain question uh, on two geometries to, to see possible, possible uh, differences. But I mean, the, the, the general phenomenon is similar. And well, I mean, was discussed in this first two talks today. Um, uh, but uh, well, I mean, to work out uh, differences in the stability analysis, as we haven't done yet, but I mean, it's clearly interesting to do. Thank you. I think we must move on. So thank you very much indeed.